So several years ago, I attended a funeral. I didn't know who it was for. In fact, I still actually don't. I'm pretty sure it was a acquaintance of my dad's or something. I was very young at the time, so I really didn't know what was going on. My whole family went though, so I just put on my little black fancy wear, showed up, looked in the coffin, and generally tried to stay out of everyone's way. That was my first experience with death. As Christian college students, we have plenty of experience with this kind of thing. They talk about it in all of our classes, right? Jesus dies, gets resurrected three days later, defeats the grave forever, amen. Jesus' death is by far the most important death in the Bible, make no mistake about that. But it's not the only death. In fact, it took so much death in order to get to that one point. Several times in the Bible, Jesus has had to raise someone from the grave. Look, Luke, you don't have to turn here, just listen. Luke 7, 12 through 15 says this, As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, Don't cry. Then he went up and touched the buyer they were carrying him on, and the bearers stood still. He said, Young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to walk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. One whole chapter later in Luke 8, 51 through 55, describes how Jesus rose Jairus' daughter back to life. When he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, James, the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She is not dead, but asleep. They laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But he took her by the hand and said, My child, get up. Her spirit returned, and at once she stood up. So we have the widow's son, and we have Darius' daughter. And then we have Lazarus in John 11. You can turn there if you would. Lazarus, oh, that's a name we've probably all heard a few times by now. At first glance, this seems to be just another standard resurrection miracle made by Jesus. And yet, it's so different. For starters, whereas the other two miracles only take up about a paragraph or so, the John 11 account for Lazarus takes up 45 whopping verses, practically the entire chapter. Why? Why is that? It's because this account is so personal. Jesus knew Lazarus. Jesus loved Lazarus. John gives us a line-by-line -line transcription of this account. He tells us everything from how long Jesus stayed behind before he went down to Bethany to Jesus wept, the one line that we always love. But why, what exactly is John trying to tell us here? Why does he go through such methodical detail to tell us what happened, even for one of Jesus' more personal miracles? Why? Why does Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead? That's what we're going to unpack. However, it's actually pretty easy to answer. Jesus is there out of compassion, right? Jesus knew Lazarus. They were very, very close friends. In fact, he wasn't just close friends with Lazarus. He was very close friends with his sisters, Mary and Martha. I'm not making this up. Look, verse 5. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Boom, right there, clear as day, right? It makes sense that he would go down to Bethany to raise Lazarus. They were all very close friends. In fact, let me talk about Bethany for a second. So you can see my map. Can everyone see this? This is my map of ancient Israel. Galilee up here, Samaria, and Judea. Bethany is this tiny little town right next to Jerusalem in Judea. Jesus is up here in Galilee because after his last miracle, he almost got stoned to death. We're 11 chapters into the book of John. I should hope something had happened by now. So he's up here. Lazarus is down here. He would not only have to go back into Judea, where people want to kill him, but he also has to travel all the way through Samaria, or around, depending. He, and get this, it's not only his life on the line, he's got his whole entourage with him. All the disciples are there too. Verse 16 says this, Then Thomas said to the rest of the disciples, Let us also, also go, that we may die with him. They were all there. Jesus wasn't just putting his own life on the line, he was putting everyone else's life on the line. All for the sake of one man who was already long dead and buried by the time Thomas spoke these words. Jesus cared so much for Lazarus that he would risk so much. But here's the problem. Verse 6 says this, So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Two whole days! Can you imagine for a second? Your best friend, 
the person you would give your life up for is sick and dying, and you had the means to travel to them, and you had the means to heal them, that you would wait so long to do so? But Jesus already knew everything. Jesus already knew. In fact, if you watch, Jesus was only told that Lazarus was sick. He, no one told him that he died. He already knew that Lazarus had died, yet he waited so long. I can prove this. Watch. Verse 11 and 12 say this. Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. The disciples had no idea what Jesus was talking about. They didn't know that Lazarus had died, yet Jesus somehow did. He knew he had to wait until Lazarus had died before going down to Bethany. But if he had gone out of compassion, then why did he wait so long? Wouldn't he have taken immediate action? My second experience with death was a little more personal. I remember it quite clearly. I was sitting in high school uh, during math class when I got the call to go down to the office. It was, I thought nothing of it. It was pretty standard because I got called down to the office a lot. All good things. Good things. <laughs> Despite everything, the secretary kept telling me not to panic as she handed me the phone. And my dad was on the other line. And he told me that my color guard instructor's husband had just committed suicide. Naturally, I did panic. So my dad came to the school, picked me up, we went to McDonald's, we got some ice cream, and we just talked about it. We took immediate action when we got news of a death. That was compassion. No, Jesus wasn't there just out of compassion alone. Something else must have driven him. If you're following along with all of these narrative accounts, you start seeing a trend. All of these miracles, all of these displays of wonder are usually God and Jesus displaying their power over something worldly, whether it be demons, nature, sickness, or in this case, death. That's what this must be. Jesus is displaying his power over death by raising Lazarus to life. This would explain why he waited so long before traveling to Bethany. He really can't raise someone from the dead unless there is someone in the grave to resurrect. This was actually pretty smart on his part too, because not only does he have his disciples there to witness this, he's got Martha, Mary, the other mourners, and a whole bunch of Jews that are there to mourn Lazarus as well. The audience is already there with our popcorn and everything. The stage just needs its star performer. Jesus used that situation and the surroundings to his advantage to showcase his power over death. But there's still a problem, and that lies in verse 35. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. He mourned the loss of a close friend, even though he knew what was going to happen. Why? Jesus doesn't lie, friends. Not in words and not in actions. He felt true sorrow in that moment, and so he wept for a close friend. But why would he weep and feel sorrow in a place that he was only there to show off his power? My third experience with death happened just this last Thanksgiving. I officiated a memorial service for my great-grandmother, who was already dead and buried a year by then. I didn't know her very well, and I didn't attend her funeral, but my grandmother asked me to speak. Naturally, I thought this was a huge honor, so I accepted quite cheerfully. The whole time up until then, I stressed myself on doing the best job I could, preparing the best speech, showing off to the rest of my family of how great a speaker I was, though I would never openly admit that. The day comes, I give my spiel, everything goes great. And then I open the floor to anyone else who wants to share. A few obscure aunts and uncles come up and reminisce about their time with my great-grandmother. And then my grandmother walks up to the stage. Now keep in mind, this is my great-grandmother's memorial service. My grandmother is her daughter. My grandmother walks up and she starts to talk. And as she's talking, you can hear the strain in her voice. And it gets more and more noticeable until she finally breaks down and cries. And then I do too. I cry for her, I cry for my great-grandmother, and I cry for my own foolishness because I was just there to show off. No, Jesus wasn't there just to show off. He was there to mourn a close personal friend. 
But that's impossible. We just talked about how Jesus couldn't have been there just out of compassion either. Neither of this makes sense. And so we are back to the drawing board. Why did Jesus raise Lazarus back to life? There's a quote from the Sherlock Holmes author, uh, uh, Arthur Conan Doyle, that I think works here. Once you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, no matter how improbable, must be the truth. We've already eliminated how Jesus couldn't have been there just out of compassion. And we've eliminated why Jesus wasn't there just to show off. So what then is the truth? <laughs> the truth is, Jesus rose Lazarus back to life to show that he is a son of God. That's it. That's the whole point. That's what John has been trying to tell us since day one. In fact, he actually says it in the very back of John. It says this in John 20, uh, 30 through 31. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and by, but that by believing you may have life in his name. <laughs> John literally comes out and says it in the back half of his book. There's no question about it. Every single other miracle that we've seen up to this point, including the Lazarus text, has been a display of Jesus' compassion, his power, and most importantly, his divinity. Turning back to John 11, 25 through 27, it describes what happens when Jesus first comes to Bethany and Martha runs out to meet him. And he, he tells her up front, hey, Lazarus is coming back to life. And, but she thinks he's talking about the end days resurrection. But then, Jesus says this, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. He is not there just to show off. He is not there just out of compassion. But both are critical in Jesus being the Messiah. He has been traipsing all over the Galilean and Judean countryside, performing miracle after miracle, displaying his power. But he's here on earth because he cares. Because God cares for us. He weeps for every death on earth, even though he knows what's coming. Can you imagine for a second? Just, just think about this. At your own funeral, you're in the casket, and then God shows up and just sobs. God, like creator of the universe, master of physics and nature, the almighty being that the heavens themselves bow to is there weeping for you. The one who could bring you back to life almost without a thought. And there he is, collapsed in front of your cold, lifeless body, tears streaming down his face because the one he loved is dead. And then he stands up. Now God is probably not an ugly crier, so he's got this beautiful tear-strained ray of sunshine for a face. <laughs> but he stands up anyway, because he knows you're not actually dead. So, what do we do? We rejoice! Really? That's it? Yes, we do. We rejoice because Jesus is the Son of God. We rejoice that he came to earth and conquered the grave so that death isn't actually a threat to us anymore. We may mourn for family and friends, yes, and we can, and that's good, but God is in control. We may be faced with death all the time, and we will be, and we will ask God, where are you? Little do we know that he's right there next to us, weeping. We rejoice in the face of death because Jesus gives us life. It's as simple as that. It won't look like physical life until the end days, but there's a much better place waiting for us on the other side. I hope to not have a fourth experience with death, but I know that's just wishful thinking. But I do take comfort in the fact that Jesus has the power, the compassion, and the divinity to raise us all back to life when the time is right. Case closed. <laughs>